so hello, welcome to the CIC lecture on the role of mechanical morphogenesis in brain development and evolution by Katze Hoyer and uh, Roberto Toro. So Roberto Toro is a, the director of research at the neuroscience department of the Institut Pasteur in Paris. Um, after a degree in engineering at the Universidad Santa Maria in Chile, he obtained a PhD in cognitive science and neuroscience at the University of Paris. He is interested in the development and evolution of the brain. Uh, his team uses computational models to better understand the origin of neocortical organization, in particular biophysical models of brain folding and connectivity. They study the ferret as an animal model for the development of a complex mammalian brain using multiple brain imaging modalities at different scales. The results obtained through the theoretical and experimental analysis of brain development are used to study brain evolution, in particular, the evolution of the primate neocortex. Evolution and development provide a conceptual framework for better understanding the variability of the human brain, aiming at disentangling normal and pathological variation, in particular within autism spectrum disorders. Their study of neuroanatomical diversity relies on massive data sets with clinical, behavioral, and cognitive data, whole genome uh, genotyping and magnetic resonance imaging data for tens of thousands of uh, individuals. Katia Hoyer uses neuroimaging to study the evolution and development of the brain. She's particularly interested in brain folding, which she studies using advanced computational neuroanatomy and phylogenetic comparative net me uh, methods in the group of Dr. Toro using large scale samples of vertebrate species, in particular non-human primates. She's strongly involved in open reproducible science and interdisciplinary research. Together with Roberto Toro, she develops open web applications to facilitate access to open data, foster collaborations, and citizen science, such as Brainbox or Microdraw. Her original background is in fine arts, and in many of her projects, she combines arts and science as a way to engage with the general public. Um, so the floor is yours. And also, um, we're meaning to ask for questions. Would you like Would you like us to leave questions for the end, or should we interrupt you as you go along? I think if, if there are pressing questions in, in between, I'm very happy to, to, to take them. Yes, when they are hot. <laughs> nice. Thank, thank you very much, Nadia, for the kind presentation. And thank you, everyone, Malar, for, for in, inviting us here. And I will start my uh, sharing my screen. Um, I will share. Okay. Uh, yep, so uh, uh, as Nadia mentioned, we're very interested in, in brain development and evolution. And, and uh, in particular, the, the, the moment that I find the most puzzling, and it's probably one of the reasons why I moved out of engineering into neuroscience, uh, it's kind of illustrated to some extent by, by this type of picture. So what's uh, the, the what what's the process in that allows our minds to to become to to appear what's the source of this kind of light that enters the window and then shines uh, on the on the world that that we are able to to see and realize that that we that we exist and that there's a there's actually a, a things and, and people around us um, mm. and then and that's it <laughs> no no that, that's not it. That's not it. I, I do have some more things, but for some reason, ah, I'm, I'm at the last slide. I'm sorry. Uh, yes, and it, it, it wasn't the shortest presentation in the world. So, yeah, and, and it's very difficult to, to think about what, what happens at that point, what makes our ability to think possible, because we're all the time already thinking. Uh, and it's very difficult to take a step back from our own cognitions. But whatever happens, and, and that's also probably the reason wh why um, I'm deeply interested in brain development, like whatever happens that allows us to, to become aware happens, happens during this period, very likely. Uh, during the period where, where the nervous system develops and we go from just a, a, a cell uh, to, a, to a fully developed uh, human brain. Um, and, and, and there's a, a lot of changes that, that happen in this very reduced period, uh, changes in, in geometry, changes in, in regionalization, brain connectivity, everything happens here. And some of those processes may be at the source of uh, our ability to, 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 re to realize that we're alive. Uh, so the, the approach that we have is, is based on anatomy, and anatomia uh, li means literally to, to cut up, uh, if, if you just translate. But, but I like to interpret that in a, in a way that may be more freely, although it's inspired by, by the real meeting, uh, which would be uh, the, the ana part and the tomos part 
Anna being this particle that you use sometimes to indicate that things are somehow similar, like in analogy, you no, know, and Tomos is apart. So the, the idea would be to try to find within the brain uh, which are the, 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 the parts, you no, know, the and which things go together with which other things, which is somehow related to this idea of a natural kind in philosophy. So a natural kind is a grouping that reflects the structure of the natural world rather than the interests and actions of human beings. And in, in many, many cases, when, when you are faced with brain anatomy, uh, you, you get to wonder whether what you are seeing or whether, for example, you know, the face fusiform area is really a natural kind or, um, or, or just some, some sort of convention. Okay, so this, these are some examples of, of very early um, uh, anatomical, I, 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 I'm sorry, but I really have to, there's my son here and it's very, very distracting. I ask him to, please, please, it's very distracting. If you, it, it, it will not take very long. You know, it's the, 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 the nice things of working from home. So this is a, a very old uh, anatomy uh, illustration for where, where you see clearly the, the parts that are easy to identify in a horse. This is a, a, a more uh, recent, although not that recent uh, example of a, a, an, an anatomy scroll from Japan, uh, where you see what, what we most of the time see when we look at, at brain anatomy in, in MRI. You know, it's like the, in, in the brain, it's very difficult to, to see beyond some sort of a repeating pattern, some sort of a texture, you know, brain folding. And it's very hard to identify uh, different parts or, or decide really if one thing is really a, a natural kind, let's say. Uh, luckily, through the methods developed by, by Golgi and with, the, with the, uh, the, the, the way in which Broadman used them, uh, we are now, uh, we, we have this knowledge about the different ways in which uh, different regions of the neocortex are, are organized. So depending on the number of layers, depending on the type of cells, their size and, and distribution, and also the, the connectivity patterns, uh, we are able to distinguish these regions. Like, are they natural kinds? Are, are those really organs? How do they develop? Where, where do they come from? Uh, and evolution clearly gives us an, an idea that they may actually be some sort of conserved real entity. Because when you look across different primates, in this case, you do realize that there they are some common themes, you know, the same type of uh, layering that Brodman was able to, to observe in the motor cortex uh, in, in humans, it's also uh, present in, in some other primates. And now to try to understand uh, what's the origin of this pattern, uh, I think that we are very influenced by the ideas put forward by the modern synthesis. You know, the modern, modern synthesis is the reconciliation of the classical Darwinian selection with a more population-oriented view of Mendelian genetics and, and quantitative genetics to explain the origin of biological diversity. So the idea would be that any, or like if you are able to observe phenotypes in, in living organisms, it's because they somehow respond to an adaptive, uh, an adapt, adaptive demand from the environment. And through selection and through small mutations and through millions and millions of years, that translates into the, the, the phenotypes that we're able to observe today. It, it, it's very much a, a gene-centric approach. Okay, so the, in the case of the brain, this is the, the, the current understanding of how this process would work. And as you will see, it's very well fitting within the, the scheme of things. Uh, so this is supposed to represent a, a, a mouse embryo and uh, it, researchers have identified a series of um, patterning centers. Here you see some in, in colors and then those centers would diffuse uh, gradients of molecules here you see some examples of those gradients, and then by some mechanism that's still unknown, uh, those gradients would become the different uh, regions that we're able to observe in, in, in the mouse brain. Okay, This is uh, also the case uh, for the way in which we conceive brain folding. So we, we do observe a relationship between brain folding and site architecture, um, especially for primary cortex and especially in, in less folded brains. And the idea would be this, you know, if you have a, a mouse brain and, and there has, have been observations that, that support this, this view, um, the expression of genes in the cortex would be constant, let's say, on the contrary, for the same gene that these authors are referring here. In the ferret brain, you do observe uh, some heterogeneity. And the idea would be that this heter heterogeneity is later translated into the presence or absence of a gyrus or a, or a sulcus. OK, so uh, the, the reason for the existence of brain anatomy would be a, a, some sort of genetic instruction. Theoretically, this is what uh, 
uh, it's known in, in theoretical biology as the French flag model. Uh, the idea would be that to generate something like a segmented embryo that would have uh, these different parts, as in the French flag, what you would have is a gradient, and then cells would be able to interpret the levels of this gradient and then become blue, white, or red, depending on the on 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 where they are located and the amount of signal they receive, and 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 etc. Different patterns can be generated in this way. There, there are many criticisms for this model from the theoretical biology perspective, uh, which are kind of summarized in this paper. Uh, one in particular is the lack of resilience of such model. Now, if you ever miss a uh, 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 patterning center, uh, then your complete organization would, would disappear. So it's, it's very rigid, not, not, not particularly flexible. If we go even further back in, in kind of history of science, this reminds to some extent the idea of the angelic movers, you know, for the, the old uh, astrology. So the idea would be that if planets move in the, the, the orbits they, they move, it's not, not because they are responding to some mechanical or physical constraints, it's because there's angels that move them along the orbits that God decided they should move. So somehow the angels are reading in the book of God to determine in which shape the, the planets move. And if they move in the shape of a circle, uh, which is the sign of perfection and on the, in the shape of a square or a triangle, it's because that, that, that's what God wished for, okay? There, there's a, 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 an alternative perspective uh, more recently. Uh, which is called the extended synthesis. So the extended synthesis is seen as a way of uh, making a, like an evolution of the modern synthesis that tries to um, include also in the thinking a, a number of, of additional properties of biological tissue, in particular uh, cell properties related, for example, to, to differential addition or cell polarity or patterning mechanisms that would emerge from a dynamical system such as diffusion gradients, sedimentation gradients, chemical oscillations, reaction diffusion. So the, if you have systems, uh, even if they are very, very different, for example, let's think about reaction diffusion, uh, you just need two type of uh, different molecules that are able to interact and they, are, they, they will produce a pattern, the, the, the zebra stripe pattern, uh, no matter what's the substrate. And you are able to observe these patterns in the organization of the primary visual cortex for the uh, ocular dominance bands, but also in the, in the patterns of the, the, the zebra or, or tigers or leopards, etc. So they, they are kind of almost independent on the substrate and more determined by the intrinsic structure of the dynamical system that produced them. We are particularly interested in mechanical morphogenesis, which is one of these uh, processes that, that the extended synthesis is trying to, to take into account. So mechanical morphogenesis is uh, the, the ability of nature to produce forms which are inherent to the physics of growth. And a, a beautiful example are snowflakes. So if you think about snowflakes, they have these very complex patterns. They have these, these amazing symmetries, very intricate uh, geometry, and, and there's no genes here. No? So they, all these patterns emerge only from the, the, the properties of the water molecules and the history of the uh, changes in temperature as the, the snowflakes fall, fall from the sky. So of course, in, in our case, the, 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 our snowflakes are this. And, and of course, they do have a, a, a large influence from the, the fact that they do have genes and they do evolve. And they are, each of them, basically uh, leaves from, from a, a very larger tree with roots that go like 500 million years ago. Uh, so to what extent uh, those shapes are also influenced by the, the mechanics of the, of the tissue that's growing. And there's been, in the, in the last decade or a little bit more, a lot of progress made in the, the physics of soft, uh, soft materials. Uh, here are some examples and physicists now uh, have a, a, a much better understanding of the processes that lead to wrinkling and folding and creasing in, 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 in nature, not, not only biological nature, but also uh, just mechanically. Here, what you see on top is just two gels 
a dark gel that's been uh, glued to a lighter blue gel. Uh, the dark gel is able to grow if you add some solvent, so it, it, it will grow as the cortex grows. And what you observe is the formation of these wrinkles. And, and, and there's a, a mathematical framework that, that provides an explanation for all these phenomena. Uh, and where we have been very interested in, in this type of process. So, so to, to what extent the growth of the neocortex on top of the non-cortical substrate uh, has similarities with this type of process. The, the, the process is actually very, very simple. And it, it, it's not only something that you would observe in the cortex, it should be present in any biological tissue, in any part of the nervous system or the, the whole body where you have a, a discrepancy between the growth of one tissue that con continues to, to the next one. And the, the conceptual framework for understanding that, that this is the, the theory of continuum mecha uh, mechanics, uh, in particular, the theory of elasticity and very, very, Simply, uh, elasticity, what, what you try to do is to understand the deformation of tissues as uh, decomposed in two main kinds of deformation. So first, there would be changes in, in shape uh, without changes in volume, as you can see here. So the volume is conserved, although the, the angles are not the same anymore, and also changes in size, but without changes in shape. In the case of biological tissue, this type of deformation is very difficult because uh, as mostly being composed by water, biological tissue are largely incompressible and it's very, very difficult to change their volume. So you can change it a little bit, but after not, not a lot of deformation, it will become easier to change in, in shape. Then uh, for the, the mod modeling of growth, the idea, if you remember from, from high school, when you have a, a, a spring and you pull the spring, it will go back to the size addressed. What you do to model growth is to increase the size addressed so that your, your model will, will effectively grow. And this is a, an example of what you are able to see uh, when you model something that would look like a, not probably a brain, but maybe a brain organoid, let's say. Yeah? A simulated brain organoid. So this is exactly the, the same process that, that I showed you before, a cortex growing on top of an elastic tissue that's not uh, growing. And what you observe are, are these folds that resemble very, very much the folds that we are able to observe in, in real brains. What's more interesting is that associated to each of these folds, you have a pattern of residual stress that's very interesting, that, that can uh, occupy regions which are very large scale, basically the scale of the whole organ. Very often under a sulcus, you have a, a so zone of uh, pressure and under each gyrus, you will have a, a, a region of um, uh, deformation, uh, tension in, in, the, in, the, in the sense of the, the axis of the gyrus. Okay, uh, so to try to better understand, uh, this process we have been studying, uh, as Nadia mentioned at the beginning, the, the ferret. This is our, our model of choice for studying brain development. It's a very interesting model because when the ferret is born, uh, it's basically lysencephalic. The brain has more or less the size of a mouse brain and no folding at all. This is P0. And then at P2, P4, you are unable to see with the naked eye any fold, folds appearing, but after one week, uh, after birth, you already see a folding pattern that's kind of a representation uh, of the folding pattern that you will have in adults, but with folds that become more deeper and longer. Uh, and by the end of one month, the volume is basically the volume of an adult feral brain. So we have developed a series of uh, methods to try to understand uh, uh, our data in particular, our data is cross-sectional. So we had to find a way of combining the surface reconstructions and the models that we build for one time step uh, with the next step and then eventually changing them all to, to get a, a, a reconstruction of the developmental trajectory for, for a single ferret. Um, and here, basically the, the idea is to use the spheres to map one mesh into the other and then uh, use an algorithm that will uh, minimize the local deformation when passing from one, one brain to the other using all the time the native space. The sphere is only used as a, as a, as a bridge. Okay, and here you have just one, one result to show you the, the, the type of trajectory we have. Um, I, I will play it again. So uh, the, the triangulation is all the time the same and you may have the impression that there's some folding at the beginning, but it's actually just a, uh, the, the fact that, that vertices are, are clamped together uh, at the beginning and not at the end. So this is what, what we're using to try to, to, to better determine the, the 
deformations that are going on during during development. Now to better understand our data, we also uh, have tried to uh, combine our work with the ferrets, uh, with our work with uh, biomechanical models. And what we have done, and here you see an example, is to take the surface of a ferret at P0 and the different tissues that compose the, the, that brain, and then apply a, a very simple model of cortical growth. So it's homogeneous growth all over the, the place, the same amount of growth, and then starting from this uh, point and in, in, in applying the, the same methods that I showed you before, uh, this is the type of um, folding model that we observe. And it's very interesting that the folding pattern, although it's not exactly the same as in a, in a real ferret, does have some of the main aspects of the ferret folding pattern and, and, and in particular the stability. So the geometry is able to stabilize the folding pattern so that a, a similar uh, organization emerges uh, basically every time. Okay, it's it's what would be then the, the, the situation in which we are now. So what, we, what I have showed you is that if you have a cortex that's growing on the surface of the white matter, folding will appear just because of mechanical morphogenesis. You don't need, of course, genes can play a role, but you don't need them to make folding, okay? So the, the, the idea that takes you from the genes to the, 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 the shape of the brain is not necessary. It could be that just the brain growth folds appear now, how do you explain that there's a relationship? How do you explain that the, the, the soul side seems to have sometimes a, an axial role? So it's probably, and that's the idea that I, I would like to propose, it's probably that mechanical morphogenesis has a causal impact on the organization of the brain. And it's actually the mechanics that's influencing to some extent the, the organization of the brain. And there's a lot of evidence showing, for example, that uh, mechanical properties of the, the substrate where uh, neural progenitors are growing can uh, alter the cell proliferation, uh, as you see here. So softer substrates lead to more pl proliferation. Uh, you can also uh, modulate cell fate. So if you grow your neural progenitors in a very stiff substrate, your, your culture will produce mostly glia, but if you grow them in a, in a in progressively more uh, soft substrate, you will start to get more neurons. Uh, you can also alter cell shape, and the same is true, for example, for dendrites in neurons. If your substrate is soft, uh, neurons will tend to produce more branching than in a, in a stiffer substrate and even for axonal guidance. So this is a very clever experiment uh, done already some, some time ago. So they were growing axons in a substrate, which is actually what you're seeing in panel A here is like a bed of spaghetti, uh, but they have, so they have spaghetti cross-section. If they, if they were just tubes, uh, you would be able to, to you know, to, to wiggle them in any direction, but because here they have this elliptical cross-section, it's easier to uh, make them wiggle like this than in, in this other direction. And axons tend to prefer to grow in the stiffer direction, as you can see in the histogram of the um, distribution of the axonal angles. Okay, so the mechanical processes triggered by the formation of uh, brain folding, so by mechanical morphogenesis could have an impact down into the organization of the brain that could lead to some extent to the development of certain patterns of connectivity or certain differences in, in cortical layer, et cetera, et cetera. So instead of a view where it should be only like in the modern synthesis framework, only genes that alter form, uh, we should consider the possibility that also form and mechanics can have a, a, an impact on, on, on the genetic organization of the brain even. Uh, I think that this brings together, and I will end with this, uh, two concepts, well, many concepts which, which are interesting uh, from a theoretical point of view. Uh, one is, of course, the idea of emergence. So in the theory of biological autonomy, constraints such as folding are regulators of biological processes existing at a different time scale and folding does exist at a different time scale than, than uh, growth of, of axons and things of that sort. Uh, and they are essential for the emergence of life and they have been also considered essential for the, the emergence of cognition. And finally, and, and with this, I will bridge to, to Katya's presentation, there's this idea of evolvability. So uh, probably mechanical morphogenesis is a very good of uh, 
way of producing evolvable organizations. So evolvability, the idea is to have an organization that will be stable enough to conserve fitness while still being able to change and adapt. So you don't want your organization to depend, for example, very often we see these papers that say, we found the gene that makes that humans have a big brain. If it were only one gene, you have only one mutation in that gene and that's the end of your, your system. That's an example of what's not evolvable. You want something that will be very robust to, to mutations. And, and I will argue that, that mechanical morphogenesis fulfills many of the criteria for, for uh, producing an evolvable brain organization. So for example, uh, compartmentalization, Folding creates modules with, uh, with prototypical geometric and mechanical properties. Redundancy, because additional folds of similar characteristics are very easy to add just by modulating growth. You can add more of these modules and then finally robustness. So the shape of a fold depends on cortical thickness, which is strongly conserved. Additional folds can be added by increasing surface area, which uh, varies widely across species. And then surface area expansion is strongly polygenic. So you will not have only one gene determining uh, whether your brain has more or less folding, which makes these folds uh, extremely resilient to individual mutations. And thank you very much. And I will stop sharing. Does anybody have any questions about this part of the presentation? More. Yeah, that was beautiful, Roberto. I, I had a question about your your model with the ferret. You, you're saying that you 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 model kind of homogeneous expansion throughout the cortex, and then you get some folding patterns that are that reflect what you would expect. So as that predict what the actual folding patterns that you'd see in the ferret, and some that don't. Is that is that because in fact you use this kind of uh, you know equal rate of change across the cortex? rather than kind of something that's more um, topologically constrained in terms of a rate of change. Mm -hmm. So where you'd expect different rates of change in say the frontal frontal cortex versus you know, occipital. Yep, yep. So uh, actually the folding pattern, when, when we just have um, spherical models, the folding pattern, if they are fully spherical, then what you have is a fully random folding pattern. So there's no preferred orientation. Now, if you start changing your models to be like an ellipsoid, uh, there are some regions in a lay ellipsoid which are closer to a, a flat paper. So a flat paper is very easy to fold. Uh, a, a dome, on the contrary, is very difficult to fold, like, like an egg or, or orange peel. It's very difficult to fold. And in an ellipsoid, you have a distribution of those. Uh, so foldings will more easily appear in the regions which have a, a more flat geometry, so a Gaussian curvature that would be closer to zero. And uh, what, what the P0 geometry of the ferret folding is providing is a template of regions which are more flat than some others. Okay, in particular, folds very often appear in lateral, which is the most flat side. And so really what, what the, the shape at the beginning is pro producing is probably just facilitating the formation of one single fold there. Now, because folds can only develop with a certain wavelength, that will impose that the next fold that will appear will be parallel to this one. You see, now if you're if you're depending on cortical thickness, the wavelength may be uh, smaller, which will allow for more fold, folds to appear. Once all the easy folds are made, like all the parallel ones, you will start going in the orthogonal directions. You know, and which which is also like, and when you have very very folded brains, what you observe is something that looks like a, a beehive. Kind of pattern, you know, where you have um, uh, th this interlocking, interlocking type of uh, stress releasing fold folds. So it's, that's kind of like, like, like what you'd see in the dolphin, for example, where it's very. Exactly. Yeah. If you look at the dolphin brain, you have folds which are almost all of them reaching at uh, points where, where you have three folds, really like a, a beehive. And that, that's expected from the, from the, from the models. Also, what, what we should observe when you have, and it's actually something that we are able to observe in, in human data, is when you have small human brains, there are folds which are just one single big fold. If you start making your brain grow, there, there's a, a threshold. So for, for some time, you, your fold will just go bigger. And then at some point, you will start getting a small fold that in a very large brain will turn into a, a, a really fully formed sulcus in that in that position. And that's also, well, I will not spoil <laughs> what comes next, but, <laughs> but, but, but you, you will see. So the, the, there's a strong constraint, of course, 
early on, uh, the importance of the constraints is more important. So as the brain gets more folded and, and larger, there's less and less constraint and folds start to, uh, to get more, more weird and, and random. Great. Thanks, Roberto. You're very welcome. I, I was also what, oh, somebody has a question. Um, Ding was asking, does the, Huang was asking, does the local cell uh, type distribution affect mechanical properties? Uh -huh. If there were, it could. But actually when we look at our histological data in, in ferrets, cortical thickness is basically constant all over the place. Well, there, there's difference in, in migration. There's strong differences in, in maturation. So the, we, we are modeling a homogeneous growth and that's a massive simplification because we want to know, you know, if you only have homogeneous growth, what happens? But of course, we are trying also to, to in, in include the, the growth gradient and to see to what extent that can add a, a, an additional layer of modulation. But what we observe at the beginning is basically a, a cortex or a cortical plate that's just one neural nucleus close to the other. It's like super densely packed and, and very homogeneous, at least in our staining, it looks just constant. Uh, so it seems to us that starting from this homogeneity through folding, you build heterogeneity more than having a heterogeneity that was uh, there before folding. I but the, the quantitative support for that argu argument sh should follow. I was wondering if this was done in other animals as well, this kind of modeling where you, you take their brain at like P0 and or also and then are there any studies that compare all do cross species comparisons at P0 as opposed to at adult or is that data too hard to acquire? <laughs> Yeah, well, of course, the, there's the, the very influential paper by Tallinn and Mahadevan and, and our friends from Marseille, Francois Rousseau and Julien Lefebvre. What they did was to take a, a human fetus brain. It was not like a fully smooth brain. There were already like there was some the, the, a, a fissure that will become later the, the, the insula or the cilian fissure and stuff that, that, of course, provided more strong um, constraint to the folding pattern, but, but that, that was a very interesting research. Uh, now, um, that's the only one I'm aware of. There, there is data for uh, brain development, like very early brain development in, in other primates for baboons and macaques. And we, we had some of that data is available and we are looking into that, but we, we haven't still uh, started brain folding module, uh, models from, from those brains, but it, it shouldn't be difficult to do. Okay, I think we're ready for the best part now. Uh, do I show that? Um, is that it? Now I should be unmuted. Okay, so now to the uh, second part of the uh, presentation. Um, I would like to focus on folding patterns and the emergence of folding patterns in the light of mechanical morphogenesis and phylogeny. Um, and, okay, now it works. Um, uh, as Roberta has already shown, um, if we look across the mammalian kingdom, the uh, folding is a, a characteristic for, for large mammalian brains. And um, there's this fantastic correspondence between the underlying cytoarchitecture and function and uh, connect connectional organization of the brain, as we can see here in the beautiful Brabham maps across four different primate species. And um, with the uh, primary motor and primary somatosensory cortex of either sides of the central sulcus. And um, if we look larger across the uh, an animal kingdom, as we can see here in this beautiful illustration by Lea Krubitzer, we see that these primal uh, cortical areas, cortical fields, do vary in their location and their relative size, and they do not scale along as the brain grows, but rather more and more associative cortices are being added. And um, 
so these geometric complexity grows along with the um, uh, underlying organizational complexity. And, and we can see the larger the brain, the more folded the brain, and also the, the larger is the number of cortical areas. And now how do these species characteristic folding patterns emerge and to what extent does mechanical morphogenesis influence the evolution of the neocortex? Um, and a few years ago, Roberto Toro has started a beautiful collaboration with the uh, Natural History Museum in Paris and um, the uh, Institute for Brain and Spinal Cord uh, to, to scan the collection of specimens they have. And among those, there were 34 different primate species. And um, so we used collaborative tools to segment uh, the brain MRI data of these species and were able to reconstruct surfaces for 34 different primate species. And uh, we then analyzed the um, volume, uh, surface area, global gerification, and folding length and number of folds uh, across these brains. And we also developed a method to study a folding wavelength across all these species. And um, okay. Uh, then we used phylogenetic trees built from genetic data uh, to fit evolutionary models and um, uh, do comparative phylogenetic analyses on these data. And uh, here we can see the primate, the, the phylogenetic tree of these 34 different primate species with a common ancestor 74 million years ago. And um, So uh, we tested different evolutionary models on that data. This is the Brownian motion model, for example, where phenotypes are supposed to vary randomly along the branches of the tree. And um, so the further the split of the species is back, the more different they are supposed to be. And here the ornstein uhlenbeck model as an illustration where the phenotypes also vary randomly across the, along the branches of the tree, but strive towards an advantageous uh, uh, adaptive threshold value. Um, and uh, fitting all these models, our data suggested that the Brownian motion model was the best fit. And what we observed is interesting. In some branches, cerebral volume uh, went uh, from the common ancestor um, all, always decreased to in, in branches like to the Galago species or uh, Lemur species. So the common ancestor had a larger and a more folded brain than many of the extant Lemur species. And in other branches, like for example, the branch leading to the human brain, there is a only increase in volume and brain volume. And if we look at branches like the one leading to the toothed capuchin, uh, we, we see an increase and a decrease as a mix um, of increases and decreases of brain volume uh, across, along this branch. And um, so these models also allow us to, to estimate the phenotype of the common ancestor 74 million years ago. And uh, this ancestor had supposed to be a larger and folded brain, as you can see here, uh, very close to the estimations we get for the now living II brain. And uh, what was also interesting is uh, that we observed a nonlinear relationship of folding wavelength and uh, across all these species, like starting from the vervet monkey all the way up to the humans, like across a volume difference, a 20 fold difference in brain volume, we observed this, a very stable folding wavelength of about one centimeter. And that supports the mechanical morphogenesis uh, hypothesis very well, uh, because there it is cortical thickness would be the determinant for the wavelength of the folding. And cortical thickness varies very little across all these primate species. Um, okay, and in, in conclusion, in uh, the first analysis of our folding uh, showed an interesting nonlinear relationship between volume and wavelength. And the phylogenetic analysis suggested that random changes may be important uh, for primate brain evolution. And um, now I would like to focus on how folding patterns emerge. Do they result from specific genetic programs? So here it's not about the number of folds, but it's about the folding patterns. And um, I would like to focus on a few species. You can see already uh, in the colors that they come from very different branches of the phylogenetic tree. And we're gonna look at those later. So we developed a method to um, transform uh, folding patterns into graphs. And so we take the, the 3D surface reconstruction, we cut out all the sulci, and then we take this triable uh, uh, Gruyere and, and shrink it into a wireframe, which we can then represent as a graph, an adjacency matrix um, where the uh, sulci are represented as holes and the gyri are represented as edges and the nodes are where the gyri fused. And we labeled a a few sources for orientation. So here, this is the fold graph of a tufted capuchin. And um, here are some fold graphs for another uh, 
selected primate species, and we can already see if we look at the toothed capuchin, king collarbones, crab eating macaque, they look very similar. And then we use graph at a distance um, algorithm to measure the distance between these graphs. So how many steps do we need to transform one graph into the graph of another species? And if folding patterns were genetic, then we would expect that species that are closer in the phylogenetic tree would have a more similar folding pattern. But here we look at, um, here's the phylogenetic tree. So for example, Cabochin and Rucoli would be supposed to have a more uh, similar folding pattern if it were genetically determined. And here's the 47 million years ago, last common ancestor of Cabochins and, and the crab eating macaque. And um, if we look at the graph at this distance, um, algorithm um, at the distance matrix here between these four graphs, we see that um, the, the crab eating macaque and the toothed capuchin, we only need to do very little number of edits to derive one graph into the next one. However, if we were to uh, transform a crab eating macaque or a toothed capuchin, let's think this one, a toothed capuchin into a durupoli, which is genetically very close, we would need to, uh, a larger number of edits to transform the graph of one into the other. Um, that speaks towards very much the mechanical morphogenetic hypothesis where um, geometric, um, where the folding pattern is more strongly driven by a similar brain volume instead of the genetic closeness of the species. And, okay, so here we see that the common ancestor of toothed capuchin and crab eating macaque was 47 million years ago. And all these uh, yellow species, the Cebide, um, had a common ancestor uh, that was likely uh, smooth and lysencephalic. And so toothed capuchins and crab-eating macaques would have had to evolve in, in parallel a folding pattern that's very similar. And, um, but more likely it, it's um, <clears throat> geometric processes that play a role here in the establishment of these folding patterns. And we see it's not an outlier. Uh, the, we can take the white-faced sapaju, we can take the great cheap manga bay, we can take the king colobus, and all these folding patterns are very similar, although these species come from very different branches of the phylogenetic tree. Um, so the first analyses uh, strongly suggest that mechanical factors may play an important role in the evolution of brain organization, and folding patterns are more similar given a similar brain volume rather than the position in the phylogenetic tree. And um, for some reason, my slides don't move. Okay. Now uh, I would like in the next part uh, to focus on phylogenetic and neuroanatomical determinants of prime behavior. Um, do uh, primates closer in the tree show more similar behavior than those with more similar neuroanatomy? And for this, we looked at more than 60 primate species. Here you go. And uh, we analyzed again all the neuroanatomical features uh, that we've uh, used earlier. So global gyrification, the volume, surface area, folding length, folding number, and um, fold wavelength. And um, so all these uh, more than 60 primate species span a 1,500 fold difference in cerebral volume. And um, then we went and collected behavioral and physiological data from the literature across the primate phylogeny. And we computed neuroanatomical, physiological, and behavioral distance matrices. And we also converted the phylogenetic tree into a distance matrix. And then we used mantle test to uh, determine whether the neuroanatomical, physiological, and behavioral uh, and genetic distances were correlated. And what we observed is um, statistically significant and strong correlations between the neuroanatomical, physiological, and behavioral distance matrices. And however, the behavioral and genetic distances uh, were not correlated, or the correlation was much stronger, uh, much weaker. And this is um, a dendrogram uh, of a hierarchical clustering based on the behavioral data. Can you see that? Yes. And um, it shows that already at the highest level, the, uh, the grouping is split into a species of, of very different branches uh, of the phylogenetic tree. So that again, we find here uh, the toothed capuchin much uh, grouped with it's much closer in terms of neuroanatomy, um, uh, crab eating macaque and other macaques and all the uh, bigger, larger primate species, whereas all the other family members like the uh, night monkey cotton top tamarins and other tamarins and marmosets and smaller uh, lemurs and galago species are in the other group already split at the highest level of the dendrogram based on the hierarchical clustering of the behavioral data. And um, 
So our results suggest that the mechanical morphogenetic processes that constrain the development and evolution of primate brain organization on a structural as well as functional level may also shape the cognitive function and giving rise to, these, uh, to the emergence of similar behavioral traits across the far branches of the tree. And um, in addition to global shape, also global expansion gradients should influence mechanical morphogenetic processes which then lead to the formation of um, the stable folding patterns. And we recently studied these gradients using a nonlinear surface uh, deformation algorithm to create, okay, there it goes, uh, to create um, uh, homologies between species. And the resulting evolutionary expansion trajectory goes here uh, from the small lemurs uh, to the um, King Colobus and macaques, and uh, we see that it jumps across the branches of the phylogenetic tree. However, the trajectory that we observe is a super smooth trajectory. And um, so that means that folding patterns were very similar across species with a comparable brain volume, despite their position in the phylogenetic tree, underlining again the important role that uh, mechanical morphogenetic processes uh, play in. <laughs> I want to show it again. Okay. Um, uh, again, underlining the, the important role that mechanical morphogenetic processes play in the definition of the folding patterns. So here you see all the jumps across the tree. And um, then to better understand this evolutionary trajectory, we, we, we fit the surface-based comports model, which allowed us to map differences in the expansion rate and expansion onset. And um, we see that, um, like the similar to brain development, we see a cotorostral gradient where in here the, the regions start expanding earlier and expand faster and uh, then in infantile regions. And um, with that, I would like to conclude. Given that neocortical thickness is very stable across primates, mechanical morphogenetic processes should lead to the formation of folds of similar wavelength, organized in a pattern influenced by global shape and global expansion gradients. And within this framework, brain folds would act as mechanically canalized, strongly polygenic modules with a stereotypical shape and large scale gradients of mechanical stress, which would then influence cell proliferation, cell fate, and connectivity during development and evolution. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, first of all, uh, somebody wants to know, wants to know, I guess, the link of the paper that Dr. Toro mentioned about a fetal development uh, in humans when they were scanning humans and trying to predict um, cortical fo folding. Um, and I, I had a question about, uh, I guess, if, if does anybody have any questions? <laughs> First, um, does somebody in the chat? Uh, Trizana Sprung Much asked, uh, what behavioral measures were you looking at? I was also curious about that actually. Oops, I forgot to mention. Yeah, we had like 40, uh, 54 different variables that we were looking at. Across the literature, there was a Pobel and Barton paper that we relied on, Dukman, Dekasian, and they were looking at home range size, social group size, social, mate, uh, social system, mating system, um, if they are diurnal or nocturnal, if they are arboreal or terrestrial. Uh, and so that was what we included in behavior, what they were eating, if it was more like folivores or if they were eating seeds and leaves. Um, and fruits, and uh, in then we like it was a super strong correlation when we had everything together. But then we disentangled it in behavior and physiology, where then in physiology we included uh, body size, uh, weaning age, uh, gestation period, um, the birth weight at, at birth weight, and um, yeah, and then our neuroanatomical measurements. So in total, that was 54 variables that we were able to include for these more than 60 primate species, 65, I think. And we were like wondering, like if there's suggestions about how we should better group that data or not, like we got super strong correlations between everything like behavior and physiology with neuroanatomy and not at all with genetics. And then if we disentangle it, it's the same like super strong correlation between behavior and neuroanatomy, physiology and neuroanatomy, but not at all with genetics, like very weak correlations, if any. But um, um, we are happy to learn if like how these variables should be better called uh, behavioral or, or physiology or... Yes, Mallard. Um, thanks again, that was both for both of you. That was such lovely talks. I think uh, maybe just to back up a bit, why do you think there isn't this you know, relationship between genetics and that 
you know, the anatomy and, and, and all the factors you just mentioned are more predictive of this kind of, you know, a, a smooth variation uh, in brain size and folding that you, that you showed in kind of one of your last slides. Um, why do you think Gen X doesn't play the role that, you know, mo intuitively, we, most of us would imagine that it would, right? Do you have, do you have a sense of you know, why, why we fall in this genetic trap as a, as a field and, and imagine that it would be the thing that it would explain most of that morphology? It has a long tradition and it, it explains like, certainly it explains many features, but there is a third factor that, that what we would like to argue for. There is genetics, there is activity dependency, and there is mechanical morphogenesis. And so showing that across development, you can't see that because in development, you would have one species and it's like the same genetic material that you look at. But looking across so many species, you can actually disentangle um, the mechanical morphogenetic uh, role uh, from the genes because you can actually see that species that end up with a similar brain volume come from very distant uh, branches of the tree and um, so that the initial shape of the brain that you give it and then a certain expansion it has it will end up with a, with a certain folding pattern and genetics may play the role of saying how much the brain will grow but at a very global uh, level. I think it was interesting. My, my uh, because you, you get to think whether 47 million years is like long enough, no? only 47 million years. But actually we find out thanks to Twitter that the, the common ancestor between hippos and whales is 50 million years ago. So we are talking about a long time ago, <laughs> you know, and, and they end up having, starting from zero, the same folding pattern. Um, and as Katia mentioned, like when we were trying to come up with a way of testing the, the mechanical morphogenetic ideas uh, with brain development, which uh, should be possible, there was always the question. But probably, you know, we were, we were uh, proposing at some point this idea of using ultrasound to push in the brain of a ferret very early to try to influence the folding pattern to move in a different way. And if that were the case, that should uh, potentially influence a different a connectivity pattern, a different cycle architectonic pattern, probably a different function, probably even a different be behavior. But people will always say, but how do you know that when you are influencing with uh, the brain with ultrasound, you are not also influencing gene expression, and then it's actually gene expression doing all the rest. And, and uh, like, of course, you, you can always bring back the, you, you kick the guy out from the door and comes back from the window. And, uh, but here we are talking about millions of years ago, the genes diverge. They live, one, one crowd lives in, in, in America. Another crowd has been, you know, like in, in Europe, Asia for a long time. So they are genetically very different in the holding patterns and so on. So you need to, you need to explain that type, of, <laughs> that type of phenomenon with like, how do you bring the genes back in that case? That's amazing. Thank you. Thanks for the explanation. Um, there are a few. There are a few questions in the chat, so we'll start with those. So for for the human, so Bing Huang, for human, for the human with larger, smaller head, does the morphological do the morphological measures differ uh, from the norm? Mm -hmm. You want to take that? It's mm, there's actually quite a variation early on. We were looking at the. I think that now with the developmental connectome brain data, it should be possible to see that more clearly. But at the time, we were looking at the NIH pediatric data. And you observe like the, the, the differences in brain volume are, are very, very early on present. And even the difference between males and females, et cetera. We were only able to look at the intracranial like you know, brain, brain volume at the time. Now it should be possible to have a look at the uh, like even, even folding, folding differences. But my, my impression would be that these differences appear very, very early already. That, that's also very, it, it's very interesting. So it's true that you do get uh, additional folding uh, even after birth. But the, the, as we see in the ferret brain, the basic layout of the folding pattern appears. We used to call, call that the, the popcorn effect. No, we thought that probably the ferret brain, if you listen to the, you know, it would start growing, 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 and at some point it will go <laughs> and transform like a, it would get the, the real folding pattern. And then it's just the same thing that becomes deeper and longer. But, but it's, it's quite a, 
in a in a in a in an event, you get a defaulting pattern layout. Should it be possible to see something like that in the human brain? Um, so there's a few other questions. I also had a question, but first, since we're nearing noon, I guess, uh, uh, Katia, Roberto, would you have a few minutes to spare for some additional discussion? Um, perfect. So I guess if anybody wants to stay on uh, to wrap up the questions, feel free. Uh, so there's a question. Uh, otherwise, uh, thank, and thank you for the talk. Once again, the, the two talks were excellent and really interesting, and there's a lot of new results there. Uh, so. Trizana Sprung Much is asking, given that there's a fair amount of cell cell variability across humans, tertiary cell, cell size specifically, uh, presumably the volume of the brain is similar during development. How might we explain this? That's, that's déjà vu. It's, it's the one we just had, no? I know, <laughs> sorry. I, actually, <laughs> I was aiming at answering that one. <laughs> sorry. I, 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 will, I will try to answer the previous one. <laughs> Probably I, I said something that's completely unreal. I was reading instead of listening. So, yeah, it, they are kind of related. No? Yes, the, the, this difference, it's, it's actually very funny when you look in, uh, looking again at this NIH pediatric data. In, in very young babies, the brain is sticking to the, to the skull. So it's actually the brain that pushes the, the skull out. And if you end up having a big skull, it's because you had a big brain. And, and, and then at some point it shrinks. So if you look at uh, like my brain <laughs> in particular, the, like the, it starts to shrink and that's why you miss the questions and stuff. And, and there's a lot of space, but, but your actual intracranial volume reflects the maximum brain volume you had as a baby. So it's a reminder of all the wrong things that you have do, done through your life. I guess it's Cindy's question. I guess it connects all those topics yet again. So the brains that have, uh, so Cindy Garcia, uh, Garcia, the brains that have similar uh, size and share some similar patterns, do they have similar uh, shared similarities in the time invested in brain maturation? Mm -hmm. We didn't investigate that ourselves, but we see that very, like if you look across species and you see the, the strong correlation with the gestation period and the brain volume and the brain folding in the end. Yes. I don't know if you know from your no, studies. No, no. And it, it would be interesting to, so actually the trajectory that Katia showed is one trajectory that you can build from an unfolded brain to, to very, very folded uh, primate brains. But there is a, a, a branch with like, the, again, that goes across many different species that has an alternative folding pattern. Uh, that, that's super interesting. So if you look at the, the AI brain, there's one fold. So we have one fold like superior frontal sulcus that kind of stops at the level of the central sulcus. In the case of the AI, it's like in the ferret. That fold goes all the way to the parietal lobe. And there's a, a different alternative trajectory that can be built around this global pattern. Um, and, and, and they, they do, so probably they have a shape that's probably slightly different so that a fold in, instead of stopping at one point and letting a perpendicular one develop, it's like probably longer, longer, a little bit longer or a little bit flatter or something like that, which allows that fold to, to, to grow all the way back to the, to the, the occipital lobe. Yeah, so, and so and it would be interesting to see then what, what's the case with the, with the behavior does that imply some behavioral differences? And, and again, it's like many different species from different places of the phylogenetic tree combined. Cindy, you, uh, you have another question? Uh, yes, thank you for, for, that, for your answer. Um, my question is, it wasn't clear for me um, how, what's the meaning in this context of the term wavelength that you use several times, but I wasn't sure what was the meaning here. For mm -hmm. wavelength, um, we like as with any wavelength, we started measuring like for for one gyrus, you start for example at the point zero of curvature, so where the adjacent sulcus would turn into a gyrus. There is where you start measuring. You go up to the gyral hill, and then down to the sulcus fundus, and then up to again to the point zero. That would be one wavelength for a fold. That's the way how we measure it and how we then estimate the the wavelength across the brain. Yes. If you have the folding here, this would be the, the wavelength. Yes. 
Thank you. I had a question going back to uh, behaviors and all these different animals. Um, I was wondering, I know that you have, uh, like there's genetic data out there for baboons and stuff. So I was wondering if uh, the heritability of the behaviors that you guys looked at has ever been examined and if it's maybe possible that for, I guess that to me, it wouldn't make much sense, but maybe that intraspecies differences would be maybe more genetically mediated if a behavior like is more heritable, but then inter, like cross species differences would be more related to cor cortical morphogenesis. Is it possible that it's something like that or uh, would that not make much sense, I guess? It was if that wasn't clear. Um, That's still like work in progress, but so far we have not looked at that. Um, maybe you we, want to talk yeah, about we, we could because in heritability, uh, what you use is you compare a uh, genetic, the degree of genetic relationship with the degree of uh, phenotypic uh, similarity, right? And so basically, there's one method where you just do a correlation between those two. And, and the, the slope is your heritability, like the correlation with the, the heritability. So we could use that together with the data, uh, Datia, Kat, Katia, data, Datia collected uh, to, to look at the heritability. Um, now there's um, what we are proposing could be uh, assimilated to the idea of morphometricity that, that was around some, some time ago. So, they were looking, for example, to what extent people with similar morphometry would have a similar tendency to develop uh, developmental disorders, for example, autism, ADHD, schizophrenia. And there, there's only one paper I know using that method. Uh, and, 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 and it appeared to be quite, quite strong. So we, we could do the same. So do a correlation between a genetic relationship and behavior and one between a neuroanatomical relationship and behavior, and then see which one's better, which, which is to some extent what Katya did with the mental test. Right? Could you possibly send that paper, uh, the one paper on morphometricity uh, yes. in the chat, please? Thank you very much. Um, sure. That is really, in that is very interesting. Um, does anybody else have any questions? I guess I think we're good. Um, it was a nice discussion. Thank you very much. Yeah, ha ha happy to take free form questions as well. Like in, if you if you want to know any anything about uh, like if you are, want to know more about the method or how Katya managed to do such beautiful surface reconstructions, we we, we use a, a, a tool that it's only in our lab. It's Katya Surfer. <laughs> Kat, Kat, Katya Surfer works very good. You, you feed that on chocolate and it produces very nice surface reconstructions. Katya, how many times have you heard that joke? <laughs> <laughs> just, just out of curiosity. Um, I'm, I'm very familiar with the middle-aged dad joke, so uh, well done, well done, Roberto. Um, we should probably, we should probably uh, end here just so that people don't feel... Um, o otherwise, we are always hanging out in the uh, brain hacks matter most. Yep. Um, which is a, a lovely place to be if you don't have an account. And if you are over there, where that's basically our lab. Uh, so feel free to, to drop any question. Um, if you're able to stick around for some kind of just student questions that are more free form, that'd be that'd be great too. If you don't, if you don't mind. All right. Thank, thank thanks so much. Thank you, everybody who was there. <laughs> Bye.